So this is from Marie-Claire Blais' novel, Mad Shadows, her first novel, published in 1959. And I just wanted to read you a short passage from the second part in chapter 8. The child was crying, but Isabel Marie had suffered such an immense and lacerating wound that she could not hear. She dressed the child quickly and went home to her mother. She was of the race of the ugly, destined to be scorned. For her, there was only one refuge, one place in the world that could offer her welcome, the earth. When she entered the house with the child beneath her torn coat and her face like a wasteland where the terror had passed, she felt a need to vomit. Perverse desires ached in her heart. Louise, her mother, moved away from her solitary chess game. Isabel Marie, did you come to show me your baby girl? Isabel Marie hid the child and disappeared into her room. Patrice sat in a corner, manicuring his nails like a girl. One of the darkest, creepiest passages in a very dark and creepy book, especially that detail at the end, Patrice cutting his fingernails in the corner while all this is taking place. La Belle Bette is a novel about monsters, uh, the first of many by the French-Canadian author Marie-Claire Blais. This is Blais in 1960, shortly after the book came out. I write about monsters because they are alone and unloved. They are incapable of love. That is the tragedy of life. I will always write about the ugly or the bad. She was especially attracted to child monsters, uh, to bad children. Her next book was about a, uh, or is about a young boy sent away to boarding school who likes to kill small animals and doesn't know why. It is the Bildungsroman of a serial killer. Part of the book, her next one, Tête Blanche, is letters that he writes home to his mother from the boarding school. Uh, his mother is also sick and dying, like the mother in Mad Shadows. This is part of one of the letters that he writes home to his mother. I took the cook's cat and killed it in the yard. It didn't take very long, and very soon the cat stopped screaming. I was very fond of that cat. I used to put earth in its milk, or else catch its tail in doorways. I get bored with everything so quickly. Why is that? Now I'm feeling sad. I am working hard at my collection of butterflies' wings. Some of them have gold wings to look like suns. I shall send you my best butterflies, if you like. He writes to his mother later in this letter, come quickly before I get too bad. She does not. Marie Claire Blais was born in 1939, uh, the first year of the Second World War, uh, in a lower middle class neighborhood in Quebec City. Like the children that she wrote about, she grew up alone for the first six years of her life. She was the oldest of five children. Um, she had a sister of whom she was very fond, uh, who was later sent to a psychiatric institution, and she never saw her again. Blay was educated in a convent in Quebec uh, for 11 years, uh, where she read classical French literature and some modern French literature, and right up to and including the Surrealists. Her father worked as an electrician for a dairy, a Laval Dairy, in Quebec City. It was a decent job, but they had seven mouths to feed, and money was always tight. So at age 15, Blay left school and found work initially as a typist, and he got a typing job to help out with the family. She wrote her first novel that year, age 15, uh, about a boy uh, 
who was sold to the circus by his father. Uh, it hasn't been published as far as I know. By the time she was 19, she had written four novels, a dozen plays, and over 200 poems. I really thought something was wrong with me, she said, because I kept feeling I had to put things down on paper. I lived in a dream world and invented imaginary characters. Her family teased her about the hours that she spent writing, but they generally regarded it as a, a fairly harmless hobby of no, of no real importance. Until one day, her mother read one of the stories that she had written. She found it in a drawer in their house and read the story. She was horrified by what she read. Uh, we don't know what she read, but I'm guessing it's fairly similar to that. And she threw it in the fire and she burned it. When Blay came home, she was furious with her mother. She said to her, you burned my babies, you burned my babies. Many years after that incident, uh, Blay was telling a CBC reporter about it. And it struck him how, how powerfully that scene had lingered in her mind. Um, she said that, he said, sorry, the CBC reporter, that she spoke about her family with what seemed to him like actual hate all these years after and because of that incident. So after that, Blay began taking her manuscripts with her to work. Um, a habit that got her fired by several employers who thought that she was doing work for other people on, on their time. She found other jobs and she kept writing. In 1958, she began taking evening classes in literature and philosophy at uh, Laval University. Uh, it's those who knew her at the time, including one of her teachers, said that she was always a little bit on the outside of the class. She would hang out with some of the younger students when they would take trips to Montreal to hang out at the coffee houses, but always just a bit outside the group. Her second year at Laval, she wrote to a man by the name of Father Georges-Henri Levesque, uh, who was the former dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences at Laval University, uh, also one of the principal members of the Canada Council, one of the, the main members of the council when it first started going. And uh, she asked him for help getting published. She said, you are my last hope. Levesque wrote back and asked for a small sample of her work. She sent him a stack of manuscripts a foot high. <laughs> he said of them, all were stories of tormented, tangled, and utterly unpublishable relationships between human monsters. But he agreed to meet her. She's 19 years old. Um, after he gets over his shock at how young she is, he tells her that she needs to be more selective, uh, more, more disciplined to get this obvious talent that she has under control. You're like a volcano, he says. She says that she has a story in mind, a new story, about a smart, ugly girl and her beautiful but very stupid brother. Like a beautiful beast, said the priest. That's it, said Blay. That will be the title. She wrote it in 15 days, her first novel. 15 days, Mad Shadows. Levesque took the manuscript to a man by the name of Paul Michaud at the Institut Littéraire du Québec, who decided to publish it immediately. And La Belle Bette was published near the end of October 1959, a few weeks shy of Marie-Claire Blais' 20th birthday. It sold 5,000 copies in six weeks, and it made Blais a celebrity in Quebec. By the spring, the book was in its third printing. Saturday Night Magazine published a profile of her called Lightning on the Literary Landscape. A French edition came out in Paris the spring, McClellan and Stewart in Toronto, Jonathan Cape in London, 
Little Brown in Boston, published English translations in the fall. That's the McClellan and Stewart English translation. Jack McClellan himself, the, the main publisher of McClellan and Stewart, didn't himself much care for the book. Um, I've taught the book several times to different levels of students over the years, and it is a book that provokes mixed reactions. Uh, and McClellan's himself was not good. He said he found it almost as difficult as Pogo, the, the, the Walt Kelly comic strip, which seems to me a strange comparison. But what I do remember of Pogo, I do remember struggling to understand some of the jokes in Pogo. But two of his editors did, uh, Claire Pratt and Conway Turton, and they convinced Jack to take her on. And as usual, once Jack was in, he stayed in. Uh, he published six books by her and one book about her, including the 1970s when she hit a dry spot in her sales, late 70s. Mad Shadows, La Belle Bette, is set in and around a country estate in a never named Quebec. The province or location is never named in the novel. When you read the novel, it feels like the 19th century or maybe even the 18th century, but there are a few brief references to the contemporary world, just enough to let you know that it's not the 19th century, it's not the 18th century, it is the present, and that the Gothic setting is just part of the mood that Blay is trying to create for this particular story. It is an exceptionally dark world. Byron Riggin, the CBC reporter who wrote the profile for Saturday Night Magazine said of it, if the sun ever appeared, which it doesn't, it, it would be black. <laughs> so Louise is a rich widow with two children, uh, Isabel Marie and Patrice. Isabel is uh, ugly and evil. She is twisted by her jealousy of her beautiful, uh, but, well, the novel uses the term retarded, uh, mentally handicapped younger brother, um, the innocent idiot, Patrice, whom mommy loves best. In fact, whom mommy loves only. And he is the beautiful beast of the title. Louise marries a, a gigolo by the name of Lance. And Lance resents Patrice. He resents the affection that his new wife has for her son. And he whips him with a horse whip. Patrice kills Lance by riding over him with a horse in the yard of their house. Isabel meets a neighbor, a beautiful young peasant boy by the name of Michael, who happens to be blind. And she lies to him. She tells him that she is beautiful. And uh, they marry as a result of this. In part two, Isabel has a baby with Michael. Michael miraculously regains his sight, <laughs> looks at his ugly wife, and beats her senseless. Uh, the baby, by the way, is also ugly born deformed in some way. We don't know the details. In part three, mom finally goes to a doctor, Louise, finally goes to a doctor for a pain that she's been having in her face and discovers that she has cancer of the cheek. And she will spend what little time she has left in the book oozing pus from her face and trying to cover it up with makeup. Isabel shoves her beautiful brother's face in a pot of boiling water, thoroughly scalding him and rendering him even uglier than her. In the fourth and final part, Louise, now 50, banishes Isabel and her granddaughter and abandons her burned idiot son in an asylum. Isabel Marie comes home and she burns down the family home, the whole estate, with her mother inside the house. And uh, we're left to assume 
uh, kills herself by walking in front of the train on which the novel opens. They're on a train at the beginning. The daughter, her daughter, Isabel's daughter, may or may not survive. It's difficult to tell. The last lines simply say that she pushes her daughter away from her and then steps in front of the train. In a very brief epilogue, Patrice escapes from the asylum and drowns himself in the lake near their home. All of that in 125 pages. It is relentless, utterly relentless. It's a tragedy, sure, about the fall of a noble house, but tragedy does not do justice to the sadism, the cruelty, the hatred, the ugliness of this book. There's nothing in it that looks like redemption. No kind of redemption in family or community, no secular redemption, no Christian redemption, no hope offered by the church. There's maybe a brief hint at the end that Patrice has gone to heaven, but the novel doesn't seem terribly convinced by that. What's missing in the book, and the explanation for its cruelty, is love. If only Louise had dared to love her daughter, the narrator says. Remember what Blaise said, that the tragedy of life is to be incapable of love, that that is what a monster is, is somebody who is incapable of love. The most obvious literary influence on the novel is the 19th century French poet Charles Baudelaire. If you look at the epigraph for the novel, it's from Charles Baudelaire's Le Fleur de Mal, The Flowers of Evil. This is the epigraph for the novel. Descend the way that leads to hell infernal. Plunge in a deep gulf where crime's inevitable. Flagellated by a wind driven from the skies eternal. Where all your torments, and for all the ages, mad shadows, never at the end of your desires, shall never satisfy your furious rages, and your chastisement be born of loveless fires. It's funny, we've been having a conversation in the academy over the last few years about something called trigger warnings. And the essential idea behind these is that you would let a student know, orally or written, whatever form, that there's uncomfortable content coming, uh, things that might trigger memories of past trauma on the student. Um, something I agree with in principle, but uh, don't much care for this, the sometimes boilerplate approach to it. Um, what I like best is when novels provide their own trigger warnings, right? Descend the way that leads to hell inferno. Do not say you weren't warned. <laughs> the novel uses the word melancholy in its first paragraph, which is maybe Charles Baudelaire's favorite word and certainly his favorite mood. They're all melancholy, all of his characters, all of his poems. The French title of the novel is very Baudelaire, The Beautiful Beast, The Flowers of Evil, The Beauty of Ugliness. There's a particular attraction in mid-century, what came to be called modern French poetry, to the peculiar beauty of darkness, of uh, things like consumption and uh, death in various forms, depression, out of which comes things like Dracula. The novel is a fairy tale world, a dark fairy tale, as most of the original fairy tales are. Lands is depicted in the novel like a vampire. It says that he has eyes like a bat. And when Patrice runs him over and Lands is dying on the ground, his body mysteriously decomposes before their eyes. Patrice is a beautiful idiot. Isabelle is ugly. Louise is vain. These are the epithets of folk tales. Uh, the evil witch, the handsome prince, wily Odysseus. Mad Shadows was published the same year as the first novels by Sheila Watson and Mavis Gallant, 1959. Kind of a big year for Canadian literature. Uh, Sheila Watson's The Double Hook and uh, Mavis Gallant's Green Water, Green Sky. These two, as you can probably tell, had the same publisher uh, and the same designer. This is Frank Neufeld, uh, one of McClellan Stewart's most prominent designers, did the designs for both of them. 
Sheila Watson's novel, The Double Hook, which is set in a, in a valley in the caribou country of British Columbia, also a very short experimental novel about a community ripped apart uh, by a murder. Um, and it takes a great deal, um, The Double Hook, from T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland and from Samuel Beckett's plays. Uh, Mavis Gallant's first novel, uh, as I've already talked to you a bit about, takes a lot from Thomas Mann, in particular from Death in Venice. The point is this, all three of these people are extremely ambitious young Canadian writers who do not see much of anything in the way of Canadian predecessors. So they all did versions of the same thing, and that is they tried to adapt European modernism, European stories, to fit a Canadian context, to make a Canadian story out of a European story. Sheila Watson said about the double hook that she wanted to write a Western that wasn't a Western. And she listed T.S. Eliot's and Samuel Beckett's help to let her do that. And I think Blay attempted something similar with Mad Shadows. That is, Mad Shadows is a fairy tale that isn't a fairy tale. Uh, it's a modern version of an existing genre, something that somebody like the British writer Angela Carter would do from a feminist viewpoint a little later, an updating of an old form. Daphne Marlatt, the Vancouver writer, says in the afterword to this edition that Blay brings a psychological realism to the moral absolutes from fairy tales. She brings a psychological realism to the moral absolutes from fairy tales. Like Mavis Gallant at the time, Blay's go-to is Freud. Patrice's Oedipus complex in the novel is glaring. It's impossible to miss. It is textbook Freud. He is openly jealous of Lanz's relationship with his mother. In Freudian terms, he never transfers his affections from his mother, and so he never manages to develop uh, a superego. He never becomes autonomous. He is all id. When he walks into his mother's bedroom, this one particular glaring scene, he walks into his mother's bedroom just after she's married Lance to kiss her goodnight. And they're not there, but lying on the bed is a cane that Lance carries all the time. It's an extremely obvious Freudian phallus, right? The stepfather's cane lying on the bed, and he's frightened of the bed and won't get into it because, until the cane is removed away from it. There's explicit evidence in the novel of its awareness of psychology, that it knows what it's talking about. When Patrice is sent to an asylum at the end, his idiot's mind was analyzed, it says. And I think that's what Blay did. What her novel does is to psychoanalyze the characters in a fairy tale. Fairy tales don't do that. They just tell you the story. What Blay is trying to do is to offer you a Freudian diagnosis of why these people are such a mess. That's Blay as, as she appeared in the Saturday night issue. She's photographed in the, in the, the window, her reflection in the window of a bookstore. The ending of Mad Shadows, the ending of this novel, um, the burning of the estate in particular, has been routine, routinely read as clearing the way for a new Quebec society, a new Quebec literature, and a new women's literature. Um, I would guess that her mother read it somewhat differently. <laughs> it is most commonly read, this novel, as an allegory about the rebellion by young intellectual uh, Quebecois uh, against traditional French-Canadian society, a harbinger of the quiet revolution that was about to begin. I am sure there is something to that, even if only subconsciously. Uh, Blais grew up in Quebec during the period known as the Great Darkness, when uh, the Catholic Church and Maurice uh, Duplessis, the boss, uh, were in control. We know that Blais struggled with the authority of her parents and the authority of her society, and there is lots of evidence in her other books that she was no fan of priests or the church. 
But I think it's a bit of a stretch to see the novel as a conscious allegory of anything. Um, Isabel isn't a separatist. She's not even much of an intellectual. She's, she's evil. It's just a story written by an extremely young writer in a few weeks. But books become what their readers need them to be. Quebec needed a novel at this time that would burn down the old Quebec and launch a new one. Critics needed a book that heralded something that would look like a Quebecois literature. And Blake gave it to them, and Quebec made her a celebrity. Her youth certainly helped, right? The child genius, that sort of thing. But they loved the book itself. The French CBC radio said, we salute the monsters. Le Devoir said, the most beautiful, the most marvelous beginning for our literature. The critic Jean-Paul Robillard said, a first novel is rarely a masterpiece, but if all writers composed masterpieces, none would be able to show their personality, their talent, and their genius, as does this young girl who has entered like a hurricane into our literature. In 1960, the Canadian press named Blay Woman of the Year in Literature and the Arts. She had by then already published her second novel called Tête Blanche, the nickname of its main character, who is a 10-year-old boy with uh, white blonde hair. His father is abusive and a drunk, and he has sent him away to boarding school against the protests of his mother. And much of the book, as I said, is, is lonely letters home from the boarding school to his mother. He is not a nice boy. Uh, the book opens with him uh, pushing a sick schoolmate down the stairs, and it gets worse from there. Um, besides the, the cat, he later kills another classmate by throwing a rock at him from a tree in the, in the playground. He falls in love, sort of, uh, with a sister of a classmate. And at first, there's a hint that she's helping him, that she might be able to stop whatever is going wrong in his mind. Um, but they separate after a summer holiday together. It is a love story about somebody who cannot be loved. Uh, another one of Blay's child monsters. It is a short, chilling book. If you can stand it, read it in a single sitting. Um, critics made this one the more important book. I happen to think, and a few other readers happen to think, that Tête Blanche is the better book. Um, but we needed what Mad Shadows did for us more than we needed what Tête Blanche did for us. The managing editor of the Montreal Star, Walter O'Hearn, reviewed the English translation of Tête Blanche in a substantial review for the New York Times. He said, it shows an increasing maturity, primarily in a less evident desire to shock than her first novel. The Baltimore Sun also thought it was an improvement on Mad Shadows, more disciplined, and less obviously Freudian. In the mid-70s, by the way, Margaret Atwood began, uh, wrote, or at least began writing, a screenplay for this novel. But as far as I know, it was never produced. I don't even know if the screenplay was ever completed. Soon after Tête Blanche was published, uh, Blay told CBC Radio, through a translator, uh, she does not speak English at this point, uh, that she was not happy in Quebec City and she would have to leave to develop as a writer. She said, I want to go to Paris where the atmosphere is freer, she said. One can write what one pleases there without any fear. She spent a year in Montreal, and then she went to France and Europe for a year on a scholarship. When she came back, she published her third novel, Le Jour est Noir, The Day is Dark. It's a poetic love story um, set in a, in a kind of dream world. Uh, it sold 6,000 copies in Quebec in just a few weeks, uh, her next bestseller. In May of 1963, Blaise's landlady in Montreal came to her room, uh, the boarding house she was staying, with news that would change her life. She had won a fellowship from the Guggenheim Foundation. 
and the man who had helped her to win it was expecting her with his wife for a drink at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel that night. Edmund Wilson, a very prominent American critic, <clears throat> New York book reviewer with a tremendous amount of influence. Um, Wilson summered as a boy uh, in upstate New York on Lake Ontario and he and his family made many trips into Canada as a child. And because of that and because he was a voracious reader, he became a, a fan and one of the earliest and most important critics of Canadian literature. He, Wilson was paying attention to Canadian literature before Canadian critics were paying attention to Canadian literature. And he was especially attracted to French Canadian literature and especially attracted to Marie Claire Blais. Uh, Wilson wrote a, a short book about Canadian literature in 1965 um, in which he says that Blais is in a class by herself in Canada. He calls her a genius. It's called uh, O Canada, an American's Notes on Canadian Culture, 1965, originally published in The New Yorker. For her part, by the way, Blaise said later that she didn't read English Canadian literature at all until she met Wilson, that Wilson introduced her to English Canadian literature. And then when she did read it, she said, I see something very familiar to me. I see the same loneliness as in French Canada and the same way to feel love which I'm comforted by as one of the pieces of evidence for something I've been starting to think, that the differences between French Canadian and English Canadian literature are not as profound as we like to think they are. So together, the Wilsons and Blay decided at this first meeting that she would spend her Guggenheim year in Cambridge, Massachusetts, close to libraries and to the Wilsons' home on Cape Cod. She arrived in Cambridge in June of 1963 bringing with her only what she considered essential, a typewriter, a, a chair, and a radio. That summer, summer of race riots across America, she read James Baldwin, Richard Wright, Ralph Ellison, and many other writers in the growing black liberation movement. She became deeply sympathetic to black activism in the United States. She was also at this time learning to speak English writing several novels, and publishing a weekly journal in French uh, in the magazine, the newspaper, I should say, Le Devoir, which was later published in English as American Notebooks. In October, she made her first visit to the Wilsons, and she stayed in a guest cottage uh, behind their house in, in Wellfleet. By the summer, she was living nearby in a house owned by the painter Mary Meggs, this house, and her partner, the journalist Barbara Deming. The beach was just a bike ride away. Uh, well, most things, the beach is just a bike ride away from most places on Cape Cod, so. Meg's, in particular, introduced Blay to writers that she had not yet encountered. Proust, Balzac, Camus, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, and especially importantly, it turned out for Blay, Virginia Woolf, uh, who would become a big influence on her writing. She met many people. Cape Cod at this time is a, it's an arts community. Uh, there's a significant number of musicians, poets, writers, journalists, literary critics uh, living there, partly because of the, at that time at least, the relatively affordable housing prices. Um, she met people like Mary McCarthy, who was Wilson's ex-wife and a prominent critic in her own right. She met John Cage, the musician John Cage, who summered there. She lived for the next six years in Wellfleet. Um, sometimes in Maine. At this time, I don't know if this is still true, but at this time, people who actually live in Cape Cod tend to leave there in the summer when the tourists come. And they go somewhere else, and in particular to Maine. In 1964, she published uh, two poetry chapbooks. So these are her only books of poetry that have been published. They weren't translated into English until the 1980s by Michael Harris. In English, which is the only way I'm able to read them, they're, they're, they're kind of sweet. Um, they're poems about childhood, daily life, love affairs. They're sweet, but not terribly remarkable, which is maybe why she stopped. And then in 1965, her fourth novel, A Season in the Life of Emmanuel. So once again, this is set in Quebec. Once again, it is never named as such. 
but this time in the countryside. A season in the life of Emmanuel is actually a season in the life of Emmanuel's large, poor French Catholic family. Emmanuel is their 16th baby, uh, born the winter morning on which the book begins. We don't actually hear very much from Emmanuel over the course of the novel, besides him occasionally thinking that he's cold or hungry. He's a baby. Uh, we don't see much of Emmanuel's mother, besides her breastfeeding babies, which she does a lot, or working in the fields, which she also does a lot. The main characters in the book are three other children in the family. There's a, a young boy, a sensitive, aspiring poet, who is sick with something and can't wait to die, or, or more precisely, can't wait for other people to see him die, can't wait for other people to grieve that he's dead, he romanticizes his own death. There's his younger brother, who's a drunk uh, criminal in the making, usually just called number seven, because they've forgotten the names of the children at this point, so they just give them numbers. Uh, and their older sister, Heloise, uh, forgive me for this, uh, just back from a convent, Heloise spends a good part of the book masturbating in her bedroom, surrounded by crucifixes. <laughs> the poet is molested, the young one who wants to be a poet is molested and ultimately killed by a priest. Number seven becomes a thief, as we all know he would, and Heloise ends up working in a brothel. On the last page of the novel, the family's grandmother whispers in Emmanuel's ear saying, everything is going well. <laughs> it's been a hard winter, but the spring will be better. We must thank heaven that Heloise sends us a little money every week from the brothel, right? Doesn't say. The opening of the book especially seems to me to owe a significant debt to Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse. Um, it's a domestic scene with the narrative slipping in and out of the consciousness of multiple observers of the scene, including uh, a substantial use of parentheses, a tactic that Wolf used into the lighthouse. But it is an extremely different world from the Ramsey's summer house into the lighthouse. Um, it is a cold, poverty-stricken world enthralled to a church that loves death and with parents to whom children are dearer dead than alive. Several Quebec publishers rejected the novel. When Wilson first read it, he told Blay, there's no way you're going to find a publisher for this book in French Canada. She did, obviously. Uh, the journalist and publisher Jacques Hibert, who is one of the most important uh, publishers, French publishers of the Quiet Revolution, a close friend of Pierre Elliott Trudeau's. Despite how I have made it sound, it is a much more comic novel than her predecessors. Um, it, honestly. Uh, it's more Beckett than Baudelaire. Um, her grandmother can't wait for the sick poet to die, the child, because he'll look so beautiful in his coffin. And because the priest uh, brings good meals to families at funerals. Um, so it's humor like that, if you find that funny. Um, people thought it was realist, said Blaise said about it many years later, that it was a portrait of my friends, of my country, and it was not. It was a kind of gothic tale of what it is to be deprived, but with humor. <coughs> it sold very well in Quebec, and both it and the English translation got generally favorable reviews. Um, Robertson Davies reviewed the translation for the New York Times. He called Blay a genius, a word that pops up a lot uh, in Blay criticism, but he wished she had a dash of humor. He obviously hadn't read her earlier books. Um, you know, this one's like laugh out loud, honestly, compared to the earlier ones. It won uh, the Prix France Quebec, which is a joint French and Quebec prize. And it was the first Canadian novel to win the Prix Medici in France, which is a, a major literary prize awarded to a work in fiction in France, France in French, by a writer whose fame does not yet match their talent, is the criteria for the award. On March 1st, 1967, a CBC TV drama called Festival aired an adaptation of a 1960 play by Blais 
that has two distinctions. Uh, it was the first CBC drama ever aired in color, and it was the first CBC drama ever produced in both French and English versions, 1960. It was called The Puppet Caravan, and it's about a girl who performs as a live puppet in a caravan until she's murdered by a village idiot. So it's, it's a blade play. Um, there are no known surviving copies of The Puppet Caravan. So unless any of you have seen it, we are left with the judgment of the Toronto Daily Star's television columnist, Roy Shields, who called it the silliest, artsy, craftiest nonsense produced by festival in many a year. <laughs> Blay herself said at, the, at the, the Quebec screening that it was childish, a young work, but she said that about pretty much everything she'd written after she wrote it, she called, called that childish. She published two less successful novels after a season in the life of Emmanuel, both of them short experimental novels about young men in trouble, both, both very much novels of the 1960s. That's Blay as she appeared on the back of one of them, uh, David Stern. David Stern opens up with uh, the title character running from the police after robbing a man on the subway. Uh, he's an 18-year-old who grew up in an orphanage and until two years ago was studying to become a priest. As far as I can make out, it's a, it's a very challenging novel to read. As far as I can make out, David and his friend, his best friend at the seminary, raped some of the younger students in the seminary, boys and girls. Uh, his friend, when they were caught, killed himself by jumping from the church belfry. And David was expelled from the seminary. And for this and perhaps other crimes, he is sentenced by judges who speak throughout the book in a kind of dark verse uh, and may or may not be figments of his imagination. Um, it's more tortured children, just at a later stage. Uh, from what Blaise says about the novel in her American notebooks, I would say that its major theme is the destruction of youth by the drugs and politics of the 1960s. Um, she says the title character was inspired by a Harvard student she knew who had lost his life to drugs, and to a young black writer that she met at Harvard whose life, she said, was destroyed by racism. The novel is told in fragments, much of it in a kind of free, uh, free prose verse. Um, Blaise saw John Cage perform in Maine at the time she was writing it, and she pretty consciously decided to model the novel on John Cage's music. Um, it is a novel born of great sympathy that, for me at least, fails to engender that sympathy in the reader. Um, I admire the intent, but the result is a little too artful, a little too pretentious. John Cage can do that to you. In 1968, she published the first volume in a trilogy, The Manuscripts of Pauline Archants. So, as the title suggests, uh, Pauline has published her own story. She's written her own story. She's remembering when she was a young girl in what I assume is Quebec City. Though as usual in Blaise books, it's never named as such. She's five years old when the book begins. She's the oldest of what will become seven children. Blaise's family. Uh, her family is among the working poor. They live in an alley inhabited by garbage bins and rats. Her mother visits the hospital for daily treatment of some illness, but she's too young as a child uh, to know, Pauline is too young to know what the illness is. Her father works in a factory during the day and at night mending roads. Pauline goes to school in a convent run by bullying nuns. At 12, she is raped regularly by the mother who visits uh, by the mother, by the priest who visits her sick mother at 12. Uh, when her mother sees blood on her legs after the, one of the rapes, um, she tells her to stop climbing trees like a boy. Because of fears uh, of tuberculosis uh, that were prominent at the time, uh, 
she is sent to fatten up in the country with relatives who are straight out of deliverance. Uh, <laughs> hillbilly savages uh, who whip Pauline until she's blind, bleeding from the eyes, and sent home. After coming home and recovering her sight, she gets sent away to a boarding school where the nuns tell the girls that uh, their periods are God's punishment. The first volume ends in a funeral for seven firemen killed in a hotel fire. This is the first volume of three. Hell is here in this very place says the fire chief, and he's not wrong. In the sequels, Pauline slowly becomes a writer and begins including in her manuscript fragments of her writing, um, long imagined monologues by people in her life that read a lot like Blaise monologues, as if she's speaking to us directly now. In May of 1969, the first volume of the manuscripts of Pauline Archin shared the Governor General's Award for Fiction with Alice Munro's first novel, Lives of Girls and Women. Uh, Blay went in French, Munro in English. They are books that are worlds apart, uh, but very similar. They are both fundamentally autobiographical books about young women growing up to become writers. They are both portraits of the artist as young women. At the end of the first volume, Pauline makes the same move that Del Jordan does at the end of Lives of Girls and Women. If I had been given my being in some other form, perhaps I could have felt a pang of pity as I leaned down to observe a person such as myself in order to tell her story but born into the very story I wanted to write, I aspired only to find a way out of it. As you may remember, Alice Monroe's Lives of Girls and Women ends with Del Jordan looking at job ads and preparing to leave town on the bus to get started on what she calls her real life. Both Del and Pauline want nothing more than to escape their origins their closeted origins. Dell from small town Protestant Ontario, Pauline from small town Catholic Quebec. Like their makers, they both realize that the lives that they want to escape are the stories they will want to write. Um, that the only way out is back in. In 1970, uh, Marie Claiblave moved to France with Mary Meggs, the painter whom she lived with in Wellfleet. Um, they lived in Paris and in a small town in Brittany, uh, eight miles from the coast. Blay and Meggs had become lovers while Meggs was still in her relationship with Barbara Deming, though you would have a very hard time realizing that from Blay's side of the story in anything she has ever published. She has kept her private life uh, very private, um, including her sexual orientation. Uh, her memoirs, um, American Notebooks, and she gave a talk in 2010 for the Writers' Trust. They're, they're, the one for the Writers' Trust is especially strange because the convention for these talks are that you talk about yourself, your, your, your life as a writer. Blay spends the whole talk talking about other writers, never mentions herself. She didn't write openly about lesbian experience until 1976 for a play by a Quebec feminist collective. Uh, Megs, her partner, said she does not like labels. She does not see herself as a lesbian writer. She is a writer. That is her only cause. She published two novels during her five years in France. One was called La Lou, The Wolf. Uh, it's the sexual confessions of a homosexual pianist, um, 1972. And in 1973, this one, Anne Julenay, Saint translated as Saint Lawrence Blues. Uh, the, the main character in it is a, a Montreal ex-con. Uh, he's in conversation with a motley crew of criminals poets and would-be revolutionaries, the kind of people you would meet today in a Heather O'Neill novel, just with more head lice. It, it, it's Blaze's first and only novel 
written in Joal, which is the, the, the working class French of, of Montreal. Um, the English translation renders it as a kind of hillbilly American. Um, in the 1960s, a number of Quebec writers began writing in Joal as a way to establish a distinct literature. That is, that this was a voice that nobody else had. The most prominent of these was, of course, the playwright Michel Tremblay. But not all Quebecois writers embraced Joal. Hubert Aquin, for example, did not. Um, he thought it did a disservice to the French language and that it was attacking the wrong enemy, uh, French instead of English Canada. Blais did not. Blais did not write in Joal. This novel uses Joal to make fun of Joal. It is a satire of Joal and of many other things, Quebec separatists, Quebec literary tastes, Quebec writers, Montreal winters. Like uh, Mordecai Richler's satire of English-Canadian taste for Inuit art, the incomparable it took, this one lands too many targets. It has too many targets to land any real blows. It, 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 it's kind of relentless in the people that it attacks. I'm sure it was a fun book to read at the time, especially in French, but I at least found it a chore now. Um, read Heather O'Neill instead. Blaise's relationship with Mary Meggs ended and she came back to Quebec in 1975 to a writer's colony in the Eastern Townships. In the 1980s, she began dividing her time between Quebec and the Florida island of Key West, where uh, Michelle Tremblay also lives. In fact, I spent a fair bit of time in the last weeks Googling around trying to find out if her house is still standing. I don't, I don't know, because uh, you know, that was obviously one of the ones that was hit pretty hard by the hurricane. She has written something in the order of 20 books since St. Lawrence Blues. Uh, the latest is a book called The Acacia Gardens, published last year in English translation by the House of Anansi. Uh, it's the seventh book in a series that she has been working on for 20 years. In 1972, she was named a Companion of the Order of Canada, along with Northrop Frye. She won Quebec's version of the Nobel Prize in 2005, the Prix Gilles Corbel, and she has been repeatedly nominated by Penn Quebec for the Nobel Prize itself. In fact, there were a lot of people who thought that Canada's first Nobel Prize would go to her, not to Alice Munro. Her later books are nowhere near as well known in English Canada as her earlier books, and I don't think as well known in French Canada, though I'm not as confident about that. I have not been able to keep up with them myself. Um, that is probably a shame. Uh, Blay herself said in 1989 that if she had to do over again, she would not begin so young. She said, I think you don't become a good writer until later in your life. They have not gotten any easier, I can tell you that much. Um, but readers make classics, not writers. And they pick the books that they need at the time. The Blay that Canada, and especially French Canada, needed was the young woman who wrote The Beautiful Beast, the young woman who started a store. For better or worse, that is now the Blay's that we remember. I'll stop there, but thank you. Thank you.